The Philadelphia Eagles and Howie Rosen have a proven draft strategy, so let's take a deeper look at how they can follow that and what we might expect on night one. And how much would you give up to draft this potential future superstar? Plus, the Eagles in a track meet? But first, let's run it. Hey guys, happy Friday. Really hope you've had a great week so far, and I've got to thank you so much. The support has been amazing. It's crazy to believe that we're only like six weeks past starting this channel, but the support, the amount of subscribers, all the likes, all the reach outs and the comments, I really appreciate it. I read them all, so it means a ton to me. If you're new to the channel, I'm Josh Davis, and I cover the birds. So make sure to like, subscribe, turn the notifications on so you're caught up to date on all the latest Eagles content. The Philly Sports Network released a very interesting article, and it was entitled, Why Have the Eagles Had so much success in the NFL draft. And it's by Nick Faria, but you take a look, there's really three main steps in their plan and what keeps them so successful. The first one is keep it simple, stupid. Now that's kind of obvious, but the question is, what does that actually mean? So you take a look at the quote here and it says, the office joke that sparked a movement, keep it simple, stupid, has brought the Philadelphia Eagles into being one of the most dominant teams in football. Keeping the draft board simple means the top players from the top schools should get priority. Jalen Hurts, Jordan Davis, Landon Dickerson, Devontae Smith, and several other top players have come from the SEC or Big Ten, the top two conferences in college football today. Before we open up a can of worms and you start arguing about what the top conference is, let's not go down that path. You could probably throw in a couple other conferences as well. I think the main argument that the article is trying to make is you take the top players in the most NFL-ready offenses or the NFL-ready conferences. And so, yes, the SEC, the Big Ten, you could throw in some others, but you take those players that are ready to make an impact, and that's why the Birds have had so much success. So, okay, I can get behind number one. What's the second step in this process? Avoid the Pac-12. You see it, stay away from the Pac-12, and I think we all know we've had lots of memories, but the quote here, is any time the Eagles have made a draft selection for a Pac-12 player, disastrous results usually follow. Andre Diller, Davion Taylor, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, Sidney Jones, and Nelson Aguilar are all Pac-12 players that the team has selected within the first three rounds of the NFL draft. None of them received a second contract with the team. I probably didn't need to read you that list. You could probably go through the Rolodex of your head which Pac-12 players have been drafted, and a lot of them have been unsuccessful. Now, I'm not saying that there's not successful Pac-12 players, and I don't think the article is either, because if you think about, you've got lots of great talent. You've got an Aaron Rodgers a DeForest Buckner, you've got a Kayvon Thibodeau, you've got Justin Herbert, Cam Jordan. There's lots of fantastic players that come from the Pac-12, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can't draft a player, or I'm not saying don't draft a Christian Gonzalez, for example, if he's available at 10. I don't know. If you want to look at the guys in the first couple rounds, that's usually where this argument is, is typically being made. It's within the first couple rounds, and those types of players don't seem to translate well. Right, wrong, or indifferent, they just haven't translated very well in this offense, in this system. Maybe you could make the argument it's a big change because going from the West Coast to the East Coast. I don't know what it is, but stay away from the Pac-12. And the third step is best available player over need. So the article kind of doubled down on this. If you take a look, it says Jordan Davis, Cam Jurgens, Landon Dickerson, and even Jalen Hurts are all examples of this. When a team takes the best available player in the draft, it allows them to remain flexible with how they rebuild their roster and develop their team in a healthy way to compete and win consistently over the years. Thankfully, Howie has taken this approach for many seasons, and you see this in free agency. He's signing players to fill needs and fill holes so that when it comes to draft night, he's not going, oh, shoot, we need a fill in the blank. It's a who's the top of our draft board. And so I think that's why you'll see him take a player that is not based on purely need. And hey, that's a very skilled player. And we've seen it in other drafts who he trades up to go and get like a Jordan Davis. But I think it's a great point. And really the best teams are always in this spot. But curious to know what you guys think. Do you follow this plan? Do you hate it? Are there any disagreements that you have? I want to know what you guys see on it. Moving on, but staying with the draft because that's the topic we're mostly on these days. But there's tons of hypotheticals you can throw out there. Elliot Shore Parks, as you see, threw out this fascinating scenario and I want to get your take on it because let's say it's draft night. The top three off the board are a quarterback, quarterback, and Jalen Carter. So who's still on the board? Will Anderson, the phenomenal talent from Alabama. Will Anderson is still on the board. But the question is, how high would you go to get Will Anderson? Per the draft value chart, you'd have to give up a number 10 and your 30 to go up and get him at number four 
or you give up a number 10 in your second round will get you to maybe six or seven, and then your number 10 and a third gets you to move up maybe one or two spots to like eight or nine. How far would you go, and what are you willing to trade? For me personally, I'm not sure that I'm willing to trade at all. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Will Anderson. I think he's a great talent and will have a successful career, but I just don't know that I want to trade up this draft capital, the lack that we have this year, to say, let's go get a player, and then all of a sudden, we have even fewer draft picks, especially what Howie likes to do. I don't see him doing it as, as likely in this type of draft. Maybe if you can do it and move up to like a eight or a nine if Will Anderson's still available, but that would be absolute nuts. And so possibly, again, a 10 and a third round, sure, I might consider it, but I don't know if I'd be willing to do it. What do you guys think, though? Is that something you would trade up, and how much would you give up to go get a Will Anderson? Bleeding Green Nation did select their player at number 10. If you haven't caught it or been following, the SB Nation has a mock draft from all the NFL writers where each team or each team represented picks a player and they go through an entire mock draft, but at number 10, the pick is out, and so Brandon Lee Gowton selected Nolan Smith, and you see Bleeding Green Nation bolster Eagles pass rush rotation with Nolan Smith at 10. And Brandon goes into more of an article for the reasonings on his pick. He says, there was a lot of pressure on me leading up to my selection for the Philadelphia Eagles with the number 10 pick in the annual SB Nation NFL Writers Mock Draft. In 2021, I made the case for Devontae Smith. The Eagles traded up to get him. In 2022, I made the case for Jordan Davis. The Eagles traded up to get him. Howie Roseman is clearly reading Bleeding Green Nation and heeding my advice. So who should I steer him towards in the 2020? 2023 NFL draft. Brandon goes on to share that he thought it was between three players, and he said Jalen Carter, Broderick Jones, or Nolan Smith. Interesting that they're all Georgia players, but his thoughts are that they're going to stick with the theme of take a Georgia player, or certainly at least an SEC, but in this case, a Georgia player. But Brandon went on to share more of his reasonings for taking Nolan Smith at 10. He says, there are some questions about how Smith projects to the NFL considering his size, but he's only an inch shorter and eight pounds lighter than Micah Parsons' listed measurements from the NFL Combine. Smith's actually an inch taller than Hassan Reddick and just two pounds lighter. There's reason to believe he can follow in their footsteps and utilize his elite athleticism to wreak havoc as both a pass rusher and run defender. I could get on board with that. Again, don't get me wrong. I would say to take Bijan here, but if you take a Nolan Smith at 10, if you don't trade back, that would be my first choice. I'm not totally hating it. I think that Nolan Smith will have a successful career and his athleticism and his incredible quickness and measurables from the Combine are certainly something that whets the appetite, but it's just, is this the player you take? Is there a better option? Or obviously, again, this wasn't a scenario in this draft because I don't think that they're able to trade back in this mock draft. I think it's you just take at your position, but is this who you would have gone with? Breaking news right as we started recording this, but the Titans have kind of dashed some Eagles hopes. So you see, Teron Davenport tweeted, the Titans and Jeffrey Simmons agreed in principle to a four-year contract extension. Simmons' agent, Paul DeRussell, and GM Rand Carthen ensure the Titans will have their premier player for the long haul. And that's bad news for Eagles fans because I think there was a very slim partial holding out hope that there might be something done with the Jeffrey Simmons or the Titans would be stupid enough to trade the Eagles for another fantastic player that we could get for a low price. But as we see, that is not going to happen and they're signing him, keeping him for long term. I don't think it's realistic. I know some people have been saying, oh, what about a trade now, now that an extension has been done? It's very unlikely. I can't see Howie going out and doing it at this point, especially with the Titans doing it now and signing. But you you kind of make the case, okay, so who are the Eagles going to get. I think targeting a player in the draft has always been on Howie's mind, but I think it solidifies it even more. And the DraftKings sportsbook odds, if you see the most likelihood, the strongest likelihood are that the Eagles bolster it with a defensive lineman. So I think it's all even more prevalent that you do that. The fact that Jeffrey Simmons is out of the running. Will the NFL be adding a four by 100 relay to the Pro Bowl? Possibly. And it'd be really cool to see. Now where this is coming from, if you didn't catch it, Jamel Dean, the cornerback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, posted this question on Twitter. So he threw this out there and said, if each 32 teams use their fastest DB linebacker, running back, and wide receiver, who would win a 4x100 relay? I like us to win. Okay, sure, everyone's probably biased and everyone thinks that their team would win, but then it's kind of funny because the NFL ends up commenting back to it and saying, won't be any disagreements here. Now, we obviously knew the floodgates were opened at that point, and Tyreek Hill started commenting. There's lots of others. At this point, there's probably just about every single team that's thrown their name in the hat for how they would have performed. But the really cool part is Darius Slay, as you see, commented back and said, we would easily. And then he had a little bit more backup because Devin Allen, for those that are 
you're not following very closely, is an Olympian, and although it's the hurdles, he runs incredibly fast, and he's seasoned in this area of field, but he says easily. Again, there's a lot of bias here, and everyone could argue that they have a fast team. Of course they do. I got to give a shout out because Philly Mike of the Philly Talk podcast, go check him out if you haven't, but he threw this out there first, at least the first one that I saw, of the Eagles would win the 4x100, and who he had is Darius Slay, Quez Watkins, Nick Morrow, and Kenny Gainwell as the four guys to run it. He also mentions, I know it's not the 40, but we got two-time Olympian Devin Allen. The 40-yard dash doesn't always translate to the 100 meters, but you can get some indications, and if you didn't see Tyreek Hill running the 60-meter indoor, or he just absolutely wiped the floor with everybody else there. So I don't know. You have a lot of hard arguments to say who is going to beat Tyreek Hill in that situation. The Dolphins have a very fast squad. But I think to me, what's exciting about this is the NFL should take a look at this. They're always trying to bring more ideas to innovate their product, to grow the game, and really to make money. But it's the no fun league, but maybe for once could we have a lot of fun? Add this to the Pro Bowl. You have a four by 100, let every single team or maybe the top 16 teams, however you want to do it, but actually sign up and go run meets. Yes, there's always injuries, and I'm sure teams don't want their players pulling a hamstring or tearing something in an event that really has no meaning, but it would be awesome, and I would pay good money to go watch that. I think a lot of fans would. Wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't that be fun to go see? I don't know. Maybe just something just crazy and doesn't make any sense, but I at least had to throw this out there because it was kind of cool to see, and it's been blowing up on Twitter. Fletcher Cox is excited to see the Cam Jurgens experiment, so if you didn't catch it, he commented or was talking on the podcast with Chris Long, and he said, he's taken some reps at guard, so I don't think it'll be all new to him, but it's different than playing center. I'm excited to see him if he ends up in that position to grow. But then, Cox ended up kind of throwing a little bit of a challenge to Cam, so he said, he'd be at right guard, and we'll have our battle during training camp if he's put in that position and it'll only make him better. But then the SI.com article kind of went in to say that's a big if. And so there's been these camps of saying Cam Jurgens is for sure going to start and Cam Jurgens is absolutely not going to for sure start and he's going to have a lot of competition. I think the question becomes who do you take in the draft? And if you take a great player in the draft, then yes, you have a lot of competition. Maybe Peter Skaronsky or Broderick Jones. You have some other guard that you're maybe targeting even in the later rounds to come in and compete for the job because I I don't think that it's just a done deal. I mean, you take a look at the quote from Nick Sirianni, and he says, you don't have to get into the leader in the clubhouse at this particular moment. We'll always see what we can do to play the best five that we have right there. Cam had a really good year of sitting behind one of the best players in franchise history, one of the best centers in the history of this game. That's not exactly just the glowing, raving review to say he's for sure starting. Obviously, there's lots of time, and I don't think that Nick's going to guarantee really any starting jobs, at least for the ones in jeopardy like this, but... I think it seems to suggest that the Eagles are definitely going to draft a player who can compete, and maybe he takes the spot for Cam Jurgens. If that's the case, well, then Cam Jurgens, you just sit behind another year, you try to learn and grow, and then perhaps eventually become the center after Jason Kelsey retires. I don't know. I'm always for competition. I think this is a good thing, but what do you guys think? Again, got to thank everybody for the support. It's been an awesome ride over these past six weeks. So much more content to come. If you haven't been checking out the live shows every Wednesday, the Wednesday link, we're going to be giving away so so many things for the NFL draft, for the regular season. So you have to be tuning in then to have a chance to enter and a chance to win. So every Wednesday night, we have three more before the draft. So if you want a jersey or maybe some other giveaways, seven o'clock Eastern on Wednesdays. But appreciate you guys joining as always. Make sure to like and subscribe. Until next time, I'm Josh Davis, and this has been the Philly Special.